Um, welcome back. I think this is our last session of the day, right? So uh, we've got an LSM maintainers panel. Uh, on the far, I guess would be to your left, to my right. We've got Mikhail, uh, maintainer of Landlock. We've got Mimi, maintainer of IMA, EVM, the Integrity LSM. I don't know, what's it actually called? Integrity subsystem. There we go, the integrity subsystem. Uh, we've got John who maintains App Armor, and we've got Casey who maintains Smack. So, and I'm Paul. I'm going to be moderating. Um, I maintain SC Linux and kind of the LSM layer as a whole. So, anyway, we're kind of planning. We've got a couple questions kind of to, to start off, and then we're going to open up to you guys. Hopefully, you guys will have some questions. If not, I've got a whole stack of cards here. So, we should be able to fill 45 minutes if you're feeling shy today. So, anyway, um, we're going to start off, and I guess, Mikhail, I'll start off with you, and we'll kind of work our way down, and then we can snake back. So, first question, um, what do you view as the biggest challenge facing LSMs today? And this could either be your specific LSM or just LSMs in general. And I guess as a bonus follow-on question, uh, what plans, if any, do you have to address that? So uh, I think the biggest, well, my point of view, the biggest challenge is for LSM to be accessible, to be usable, and, well, to do something useful. So usability, I would, get, I would say. I think that's fair. I think probably that applies for most of us. <laughs> uh, what, do you have any plans to, to address that? Um, well, I'm doing my best with Landlock. Um, and other than that, well, I think, well, working on user space tools, tooling, and documentation is what we should do. So, yeah, nothing magic, okay. but yeah. All right, thank you. Mimi? <clears throat> you want to repeat the question? Sorry, okay. Uh, so what do you view as the biggest challenge facing LSMs? And this could either be, you know, feel free to answer specific to integrity subsystem or just LSMs in general. And as a bonus, if you've got a good answer for this, you know, do you have any specific plans to address that? Okay, so we're going to stay on the integrity subsystem, and so the biggest challenge is making sure that no new integrity um, <laughs> um, gaps are introduced, and how we do that. Um, I think that I'll leave that for later. That's fair. That's fair. Okay, thank you. John, do you, I can repeat. Actually, my answer kind of follows on Mimi's there because I think one of our biggest challenges is we keep having new um, capabilities introduced in the kernel that we don't have mediation for and we keep having kernel devs avoid the LSM. And <laughs> I really don't know how to get them to, yep. to you know, check with us and get hooks and... <laughs> or at least work with us. Work with us, yeah. Ways. Yeah, no, I, I, I understand. I think we've kind of all felt that pain at some point. And I guess to be clear, when you say capabilities, you're talking about just functionality in general. Functionality. Not, not yeah. POSIX capabilities. And well, things. I'm... That, yeah. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's a whole issue in and of itself, the, you know, them throwing everything at cap Mac admin or... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Do you have any plans on, or do you have any thoughts, rather, on how to improve that? I do have some thoughts on how to maybe improve it, but getting people to go along with it would be difficult. <laughs> um, so I, I would like to see, you know, actually capabilities broken out in the kernel and it become uh, LSM calls instead and then re-put back together so we have more context when it's coming in as to everything being cap Mac admin. And then if nobody had access to directly to capability or ptrace like that, then they would be forced to say security something and then potentially we might get a little bit more interaction. That's a good point. Yeah, especially when you consider most of the places in the kernel that we would want an LSM hook, you generally have a capability call of some sort in that yeah. section of code. So yeah, that, that could be a good idea. Thank you. Casey, I know you've got some ideas. Me? Yeah. Me? Yeah. Yeah, okay. I can repeat the question. No, that's quite all right. 
I think the biggest single issue that we've got with the LSM is that our security paradigms are 30 years old. We're starting to see things like Landlock come in, where it's a different mindset, a different way of looking at things, as opposed to what we mostly got now, which is uh, based on the mainframe sitting in the corner being shared by people who don't trust each other. Uh, by encouraging more new things to come in, new paradigms, new ideas, new ways to look at security that are more appropriate for the systems we have today than the systems we had 30 years ago, I think that we can actually greatly improve the systems and the usability and the usefulness and, and avoid a lot of the things that we see as modern problems. Got any plans to fix that? Well, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> uh, I think one of the biggest, one of the obstacles we've got is it's very difficult to implement a new idea LSM if you're looking at, at the current distros and you're saying, this would be great, but I can't get it into, there's no way I can get this into the distros. So if we can get a module stack into the point where you can use, use useful things in addition to SE Linux, not to say SE Linux isn't a useful thing necessarily, yeah. um, but uh, that will actually sh should help e grease the skids, as it were, and make it easier for people to do things. I think that's fair. All right, why don't we do one more question, then we'll we'll open it up. Um, so I guess we'll we'll snake. So this is I'll start with you again, Casey. All right, so you don't get any time off on this. Okay. Um, shifting gears a little bit, so. Not necessarily talking about problems, although it could be a problem, but it's nice if we've got positive up here. But So what do you view as the most important change um, that's currently under development? Once again, this can either be something that you're working on or something at least that you're, that you're aware of. Well, I, I can't help but say that the LSM stacking is the most important thing. <laughs> And that's, that's fair. But, I was, I was kind I, of expecting that. Uh, yeah. Yeah, well, it doesn't, it shouldn't come as a surprise. <clears throat> and the first iteration of stacking that we got in um, that enabled Yama to be something other than a wart, and there were a couple of other, other lesser LSMs that were coming along. There were going to be warts too. Uh, warts are bad. General, generality is usually a good thing. Uh, Sometimes you have to have to pay a price for it, and we are. We're paying a, a bit of a price for this. Um, but I think that that actually, you know, it opens up things in a way that they're, they're really not now. It's, they're, it's too, too much overhead to get in as an LSM these days, and if we can make that easier, that'd be really a positive thing. I think that's right. I think that's probably what we all expected you to, to reply with. So that well, was. he didn't. <laughs> really? <laughs> all right. Anyway. Um, so all right. So John, sure. hopefully, hopefully a different answer. Surprise us. Surprise you. Um, so I do think Casey's right. The LSM stacking is the next immediate thing. The thing we need to follow on with that. Yeah. After that, though, is is somehow to come up with some name spacing around the LSM. And it's a question that we very much haven't solved yet. Uh, and it, 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 stacking in itself is not sufficient for several of the use cases. And so that is the next thing we, we have to be working on and figure out around the LSMs and whether, you know, whether some, there's something we can do that's unifying to them or it, you know, just enough that each one can do its thing. I, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, I think it's fair, and I think I know at least in informal discussions whenever this comes up, I think it's still very much an open question for just all of us as to right. the best way to handle that. Well, I don't even think most of the LSMs know how they want to handle it themselves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's, some, there's some big challenges there for a lot of, yeah, so. Right. Amy. So I'm um, actually, the biggest gap right now, we had a talk on it by and that is the interpreters and the way that files can be ex read and executed by the interpreters. Um, if we can close that integri integrity gap, that would be amazing 
So I'm waiting and looking forward to having that. And any help I can offer. Yeah, so, <clears throat> well, uh, first thing is without SM stacking, at least the first um, step, which is upstream yet, our lock will not be there, or at least, at least not useful. So um, I think LSM stacking is very, very important. Um, but yeah, as uh, it was already said, uh, stacking is one, one thing, and being able to compose different LSM policies, or different security policies, but in this case, different LSM policy would be quite a challenge. So um, that would be interesting, definitely, but very difficult too. All right, um, so we still got plenty of time left. So why don't we open it up if you guys aren't asleep yet. Um, <laughs> any questions that you guys might have for anybody up here or for everyone, feel free. What do you feel are some of the most significant emerging threats to Linux systems these days? Always a fun question, right? Um, does anybody want to jump in? Otherwise, I can start picking at people. Uh, I would say at this point, it's the divergence between um, phones and embedded systems. They have fundamentally different security threat models, and we're using the exact same software in both cases. Uh, that's going to lead to a case where things will drift in one direction for a while, at the expense of another of the other other side, and then these people are going to say, "Oh, oh we've got to fix those problems," and then it'll tr start drifting back, and then it'll cause system problems over here. So, coming in some way, and whatever this is, to identify the threat models more clearly, so that they can be differentiated, so you can say, "I'm fixing this for this threat model, and I'm not fixing it for this one." because this one doesn't really care about it. And so people can have an understanding of why is this security feature going in? It's completely worthless. You know, who could possibly be using it? Well, the light bulb people want it. Well, the light bulb people have different requirements, and so, so long as you understand that there's a reason for it, even though it's not your reason, we can get, a, I think, a more synergistic uh, flow of understanding of it and tolerance of other people's development. I think that's interesting sometimes because in cases where the different requirements can be made compatible, I think that works. But I think we've all seen cases where sometimes requirements are at odds. And I think that's where the real fun begins. Um, yeah. But, you know, we have ways to dealing with that and you just have to pick sometimes, which it's not great, but it does work. Um, does anybody else want to? Sure. Um, one of the big threats we're seeing is everything is, everybody wants things to be secure, but they're pulling their source code from everywhere. It's like, we're just pulling straight from GitHub, you know. Uh, we have our, our script, we're running our script, and it goes and grabs a script and brings it down and starts running it. And trying to secure that source chain and what's coming in and verify what's there uh, I mean, the supply chain attack is the really big problem right now for from our point of view as a, a company that we work at, um, trying to figure out how to deal with that and what people's workloads are with everything being so dynamic. Uh, it's, it's ugly. <laughs> we even, I mean, even extending beyond that to problems that you think we should have solved. I mean, we've been talking about this. We, yeah. I mean, BPF, right? There's still no sign integrity checking of BPF programs. So you're loading code into the kernel, then right. no, no assurance of that hasn't been tampered with or where it came from. So yeah, this is still a big problem. So. Right. Um, Thank you for answering the integrity aspect of this. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, did, I didn't <laughs> want to steal your thunder. I mean, yeah. do you have anything you want to add to that? Or? No, that's fine. Okay. EBPF right. is fine. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah, I think the, well, one thing to, to keep in mind and to uh, 
repeat and repeat and repeat is that there's no one Linux. There's a lot of different Linux, different kernel first, and different use cases and different systems. So a lot of different set models and a lot of different um, priorities. So um, yeah, it's difficult to to answer, well, what is the most important threat model? What is the most important kind of attack? Well, it depends on your system, your product, and what you do with that. Um, but I think what is becoming more and more important uh, over the last decade, maybe, uh, is that the, well, attackers are, well, it's becoming more and more, well, it is, um, like, really, real job, and uh, the attacker skills are more and more, um, uh, well, professional. And uh, so, yeah, the threat is kind of higher than it was maybe 20 years ago. Uh, I think especially for, well, attacking critical stuff like the kernel. Um, so um, we need to protect user space with LSM on any access control system. Uh, but we also need to care a lot about the kernel and to find new ways to protect it, um, well, to help it protect itself or to rely on something else. Hopefully we answered your question a little bit. All right, thank you. Does anybody else have a question? Um, I wanted to push a little bit on eBPF, which you just mentioned in that last question. Uh, besides signing EPF, eBPF so that we have something much like signed modules, do you see any other place where LSM has a role to play with respect to eBPF? I think historically speaking, you know, modules have been considered out of scope for LSM because we're just sort of extending the kernel. Um, and, you know, LSM is really more about, you know, trying to control what user processes do, but eBPF is sort of in this weird middle space. It both extends the kernel and is very often arbitrary things that are inserted into the kernel by not necessarily trusted user space programs, and uh, that's a little terrifying. It is, and there's, I think there's some philosophical differences around access control between most of the people in this room and a lot of the eBPF developers, which further complicates things sometimes. Um, but anyway, let, let me open it up to you guys. Um, somebody surely got to have thoughts on this. <laughs> e but eBPF is terrifying. <laughs> uh, uh, so from a distro point of view, uh, one of the things we've had to deal with is all the CVEs coming in from eBPF and all the, the attacks. Um, it has been used every year in Pwn to Own when we've been a participant. Then uh, they just keep adding new things and they keep saying the verifier is, you know, it's security by verifier. And yet, so for example, hot BPF, not to pick on it, but um, yeah, it, it, the verifier can do so much, but as soon as you open it up to being able to write to the kernel, the, the verifier, that's not really doing anything for you as security-wise. Now you can do anything with it, right? Um, and every time they open up a new capability for eBPF, we see new problems. Um, and there's no real control of that. And I would, I mean, there, there's a little bit of control in eBPF on what subsystems are available, but I would like to see uh, much better control over that, um, where we can do something more than just say, well, we're just going to block eBPF. Um, and some granularity there, I would love, love to see better controls on that. Yeah, and I, I think that's a good point about not wanting to block things. I mean, a lot of times I feel like people, especially other subsystem maintainers, are like, well, you just want to disable it. We really don't want to disable stuff, right? I mean, we don't, we, we're developers, we're users too, right? I mean, we want to be able to make use of all these things, but we want it to be safe, and we want to make sure that we have all the necessary stop gaps and controls in there. So, yeah, I think that's a good point, which is sometimes lost, but. The and, and the first one is, of course, from an integrity perspective, 
that we only want those things that are signed by known keys um, that we control and how they get in is really important and not um, randomly. So it's still the same issue, an integrity gap, but that doesn't answer your question. I mean, disabling uh, eBPF, we, we can all sort of pretend like uh, is disabling eBPF is still an option, but realistically it's not. Like that ship has sailed, right? If you look at a modern distribution today, Fedora, whatever, then you will be faced with lots of eBPF programs. And usually and not necessarily, it's, it, it's not wrong. Like it's useful uh, abilities. David is looking at me like I just committed heresy. <laughs> <laughs> But, you did. Uh, I mean, the only way to realistically uh, address this is if there is some sort of regular exchange, like how involved are the LSM and the security modules in uh, uh, in eBPF. And like I agree, I mean, there's a lot of, I wouldn't call it terrifying, but there's a lot of creative uh, uh, and potential, uh, potentially security sensitive changes coming and they keep innovating, which is their right to do so but so we in the end need to deal with this like we can't just tell them go away i mean you can try but you will fail well so the one of the things that i i think is very important about the the EB, ebpf is that I, I believe now i could be wrong here but my, my understanding is when it was accepted in there was kind of this notion that you guys are going to be careful with this and well, and first off, the the, the people who develop the, the programs, pieces, right? Okay. Well, the people who develop the programs aside, um, there are things about the way it was implemented that were eyebrow raising to begin with. For example, the, the, there's a hook for every LSM hook available, um, which isn't the model of the LSM infrastructure, and that has led to to more than one. Uh, significant problem uh, and if somebody really wanted to do bad things on an SE Linux system all they would have to do is implement an eBPF uh, hook for uh, uh, security context to sec ID um, which could cause all kind yeah you know, it could cause all sorts of bad things to happen and so There wasn't a lot of, you know, it, it was put in, it was like, oh, here's, here's the convenient way to do it. Okay, now we're done. Well, you need to be more careful than that. And I think that that's something we've seen in a couple of other subsystems as well recently. IOU ring, <clears throat> for example, yeah. where it's just, they weren't careful. And it, being more careful with the, you know, going into the infrastructure that's there already is something that, we could do better on in Linux in general, and uh, think that in, in, the vicinity, in the vicinity of security in particular. So. And I think at the risk of generalizing your question a little bit too much, so apologies if I do that, but um, I, with all your points, like I said, we're, we're not trying to disable stuff. So like you said, I mean, I wanna use the cool new features too, right? Um, but I think the, the issue isn't necessarily specific to eBPF. There's this greater issue at large. We mentioned IOU ring and um, at LSS last year, there, I gave a talk on this and some of the challenges we had there. And you know, next year, it's probably going to be something else. And there'll be something else the year after that. Um, there's, what, thousands of kernel developers. And I don't even know how many different subsystems there are. And unfortunately, there's not nearly enough LSM developers, I'm not just talking about us, just developers and people interested in kernel development or on access controls, where we can go out and keep track of every single development effort that's going on. You know, there's, there's, we try, I've been trying to automate somewhat, you know, and watching Linus's tree to detect when things come in with certain things that generally tend to be of interest from an access control perspective. It's, you know, we gotta read stuff like LWN a lot. You know, I, I live reading the LWN things, just try and catch things. But even then sometimes it's, we're talking about this. One of the problems we had with IOU ring is, um, you know, there's the credential sharing issue, which I think we probably don't know about at this point, but when they introduced it, they called it personalities, which is challenging because 
some of you may not know this, there's already a personality concept in the kernel. And so if I remember reading the LWN article and I saw personalities and I thought, it's kind of odd, why would IOU ring care about personalities? And so I just kind of ignored it. But then when you look at the code and you realize, no, personalities is actually credentials. Um, so there, there's all sorts of challenges and I don't think there's a right answer other than we need to find a way to, to work together, right? Um, and we can try, like I said, we can go out, but I think we also need to somehow get the other subsystems to be willing to work with us a little bit more. Um, you know, and when they're, when they're developing significant new features, just send out a post to the LSM list. Even if you don't want to post the full patch set, just say, hey, we're working on this, here's a pointer to the mailing list archive. Can you, can you take a look, tell us what you think, tell us there, is there anything we should potentially be concerned about? And I think, I don't think anyone up here would object to that. No, yeah. So I just want to add one more thing to that. And um, I was wondering if we have documentation um, all the steps that have to go through when you apply send in patches. Why can't adding a step that says make sure that if there's any um, sort of security or integrity issue that there's a call there, that there's a security hook, um, whether or not, and then we will at least have a heads up that something is going on. Um, and that would be more of um, maybe for the documentation people <laughs> to well, respond. I, I think also just kind of socializing that with other kernel developers and, and maybe the maintainers of the larger subsystems. And I know one of the suggestions that Case made when we were, yeah, hi, um, we were talking about IOU ring last year, and I apologize, I haven't had the time to follow up on this yet, but um, you can put, I think you said you put some regular expressions in the maintainers file so that when people use, um, you know, Get maintainers, you know, if we can flag certain certain keywords, certain functions, that will get sent to the LSM list. But I also kind of wonder how many um, how many experienced kernel developers actually still use Git maintainers, right? I think Git maintainers is one of those things that you, when you're first starting That's, out, you use it. But I think all of us, when was the last time you used Git maintainer? Oh. Hmm. Recently, when about two weeks ago. <laughs> oh. When I write something in another. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. If you use B4 for sending right. patches, yeah. it will automatically run it. Uh. <laughs> Constantine would be very happy that you mentioned that. He's right. not here today, but yeah. B4 is great. <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> if you're watching on the video, see, there we go. Um, all right. I think that before we move on, did anybody else want to? No? All right. Well, thank you. That was a good question. Um, did anybody else? Uh, I am contractually obligated to ask, uh, has anyone given any thought to using Rust in LSM layer? <laughs> yes, but only to piss people off. <laughs> uh, all, all kidding aside, a, la a language transition is probably the most dangerous thing you can do. Um, it is probably a, a better idea to rewrite from scratch than it is to try to change your system from one language to another. Uh, the thought paradigms are very different when you're writing in one language from another. I once did an implementation of make in Pascal. Uh, <laughs> it was very small and it worked, you know, it worked just fine, but you, there were things that just fall out naturally when you're writing in C, that if you're writing in a different language, you don't do it that way. You do it a different way. And so I think that the whole notion of, oh, well, we'll, we'll incrementally switch Linux from C to Rust is going to be very frustrating, and I think it's probably not the right approach but that's, I'm an old guy. Yeah. So I've thought about Rust as well. Um, my biggest issue with Rust there is, is time, right? 
um, we're already way under, you know, we need help, right? And we don't have enough time to do everything we need to do. And then trying to take the time to rewrite something in Rust is just, is that one extra thing and you're never getting to anything else. Uh, I, I do have concerns that, you know, how do I rewrite? Just a part, you know, just one part, so I can do it incrementally and and not break everything. Uh, it, you know, it's 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 a problem. I also think that a, a better approach is probably to look at some of these ancient services and demons that we've got that haven't changed in 16 years. Uh, those might be better candidates. They don't have any. They don't have any bugs, right? It's been 16 <laughs> years. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> I think it's uh, it's correct for the kernel, but it's correct for any software. Rewriting from one language to another is costly. In time in uh, well, bugs that just that are already fixed and so on. Um, so yeah, definitely. Developing new stuff in Rust is definitely a good idea. Uh, rewriting stuff uh, is much more. Yeah, the annoying phone yeah. is mine, sorry. Um, but yeah, I'm. Nobody I'm, ever calls. I'm, great. I'm really grateful that we can write some kind of code in Rust. It's really good. And I think a shameless plug you've got a landmark library that's written in Rust. Yeah, well, right? yeah, yeah. yeah. For use space, it's. Uh, yeah. well, yeah. Yeah. And uh, further shameless promotion, if, uh, if other people were interested in rewriting really small LSMs that exist already <laughs> in the kernel in Rust, I would be happy to review that. <laughs> Not that I have you, time to do it do myself. You, do you have any suggestions? <laughs> load pin. What's that? I think the load pin LSM would be really straightforward because Yama it's a might even bit of checking. be simpler. I mean, Yama's, Yama's what, one page of because, code? Yeah. Yama's awkward because it walks the process tree and trying yeah. to do that. I don't think we've got good APIs for that right now. Oh, okay. But load pin is really simple. <laughs> anyway, that's it. Okay. Well, thank you. So uh, just a follow-on question. Would it make sense to have an LSM Rust API, that, like a native Rust API in the kernel? So new LSMs could be written in Rust. Do you, when you say an LSM API, are you talking about the, the hooks layer? Yep. Is that, is that, um, is that, that how is, it would work? I, I don't know how it, it works. It would be a requirement, yes. It would be a what? Sorry. A requirement. We need, well, if we want to write a new LSM, well, you need to have a, an LSM API in Rust. Yeah. And I think that would probably be, we're intentionally trying to keep that layer as thin as possible. So the, the logic in the LSM layer itself is pretty slight. I think even with stacking, yeah. it still remains relatively we're, slight. Yeah, it, we're pushing things into the individual LSM code rather than having it in the layer. There are a couple of places where that's rather inconvenient um, and dubious, but y you, you do want to have some sort of philosophy about your, in uh, if you're going to have a, an infrastructure, you want to have a philosophy behind it. And I think the other thing with making a Rust version of it is that we would very much have to take a significant look at what we've got and see whether what we've got is actually um, the right thing to do to to pull that, you know, to, to enable that. Uh, whether that infrastructure is really uh, appropriate for that for that kind of use, or if we're going to do something like that, do we want to have something else? The only okay. thing I can add to that, wearing my LSM maintainer hat, is I think I'd want to see the Rust capabilities in the kernel develop a little bit more. Get gain a little more maturity before we started to, to go down that path, so. Yeah, putting on my distro hat um, right now, Rust is a problem for building kernels. 
So we have to build kernels back on older releases, and we have run into already run into problems with kernels with the rust landed and its broken kernel builds. Um, and so we, we very much would like to see a little bit more maturity on the rust side before we roll it out more. Sorry, it's still on the Rust side of things. Um, my understanding of Rust as well is that currently it doesn't actually build on all the architectures that the Linux kernel builds on, yes. which could be a bit of a problem for anything that's considered to be kind of core to the kernel, like an LSM. So that's why like, it feels like Rust is a great fit for leaf driver modules type thing, but not necessarily for something as core as like rewriting one of the main LSMs, for example. And <clears throat> also one thing to keep in mind if for any piece of software, if you want to rewrite it, well, the developers and the miners need to understand that so, and to uh, yeah, have this skill. So that takes time too. One of my personal favorite ways of breaking catch-22s of it's not mature enough yet is to make things require it and suddenly maturity evolves <laughs> rapidly. <laughs> And, oh no, I can't build the kernel on this architecture. Suddenly, we gain architectural support that we needed. So I'm not sure it's a reason to avoid those kinds of things. I think it creates work, but it's work that is already needed. So I think it's, uh, it's, it's a way to uh, prove where there are actual needs um, as opposed to theoretical uh, deficiencies. So I... I I think it would be an interesting area to explore because I think the interface is relatively simple um, as far as the hooking goes compared to, you know, DMA and graphics engine submission and all the other crazy things that we do have interfaces for uh, now. So I, I think it would be an interesting area to explore. So I'm very sympathetic to the let's just do it and see who complains sort of thing. I mean, I think probably <laughs> I've definitely done that in the past on a few things. I'm like, oh, we'll throw it in the next branch and see, uh, we'll force, force somebody's hand. But um, I think there is the other issue that we've it's popped up in a few of the questions where there's a lot of work to be done and we just don't have nearly enough people to help contribute on this. Yeah, well, that's another interesting part about it is suddenly if you have a Rust API, other people materialize to do the work. Or maybe less. Because sometimes less, but yeah. it doesn't appear to be happening. So uh, I'm excited by that piece as well. As someone goes, oh, wait, you mean I don't have to write in C? Well, yeah, sign me up. Let's do some kernel work. So. I've been burned enough times on the if you build it, they will come sort of <laughs> argument that that doesn't. <laughs> True. I, 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 I understand that's an argument. I know a lot of people believe strongly in that. And Rust is extremely popular these days. But um, I personally am going to need a different argument for that. But. It will require mentorship, but yeah. that's going to be true for anything. Yeah. If it's not a Rust question, you can actually ask two questions. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a Rust question. Hey, you get two then. Unfortunately, I only have one question. Oh, wow. Well. So I'm uh, going back to a slightly earlier topic. Uh, I'm one of those uh, BPF developers that makes incorrect assumptions and terrifies you guys. Um, Casey, you touched on this uh, briefly earlier, but I was curious what all of your guys' thoughts are uh, on uh, BPF LSM. The BPF LSM? Yeah. Um, I'll use his answer, which is it's terrifying. Uh, it it's insufficiently well defined as to what's going to what's going to happen if you if you have this LSM in place with respect to the other LSMs. Um, there was a bug a while back with one, in, in one of the hooks where nobody got called ahead of BPF and it said, yeah, I'm, I returned the wrong value, or the value other than what was expected. Um, this was probably a pretty reasonable assumption for this the BPF developers to make based on the general behavior of the LSM infrastructure. But this was one that, that did things a little bit differently. And so when 
when you don't have the level of review that we provide for LSMs. So when somebody pro you know, proposes a new LSM, in general, that gets pretty thor thoroughly kicked around. Um, we all look at it. Um, these couple of the other people always look at it because, well, we're kind of curious about what it is that they're trying to do that we didn't think of. And that's not true with an EBPF program. No, best we can tell, nobody's going to look at it. And best we can tell, the BPF infrastructure that's implemented as, as an LSM isn't going to protect it that, that well either. So it doesn't fit, uh, fit very well into the paradigm we've got. Um, well, I understand why you want it and what the advantages of, of it are, but it would be real nice if it were more like other LSMs in the way it's implemented, in the way it's actually you know, fit into the system. It, the other one of the other issues I have with eBPF LSM is it is allowing for security modules that are not basically going to be reviewed by the community. They're they're coming private companies are they're making these modules and it's not being open sourced essentially and it's going into the kernel and doing its thing and we we don't get to see what's going on. I know of a couple of case of this, cases of this already, and that you know from a, a open source perspective, that really bothers me. Yeah. yeah, it's really flexible. You can do a lot of stuff, but yeah, there's downsides. So yeah, if you, you don't trust the people that write the code, the policy, well, there's an issue. So, so when we talk about signing things, signing B EBPF modules and things like that. First of all, um, the maintainer basically told me, IMA is not the solution. And he kind of kicked us out. Um, the other issue, not that we're listening. <laughs> and I believe that Roberto tried to address it and his patches are still waiting there. Um, but I think that maybe um, I, we had a side discussion earlier, and the talk that addressed um, the last talk was about requiring more information in, this, um, in the keys. How can keys be used? What they should be used for? And I think that, um, um, that going forward, maybe we need more granularity and to say how EBBF can, if they're signed, assuming we get the signatures in, then how can these be signed and which keys can be used so that we don't have this, you know, enormous granular, you know, no granularity. It's either all or nothing. And I think that that might be a way of constraining it. And I think with that, we're at time, aren't we? Okay. Does it, well, does anybody have any questions? I mean, you still have an extra question if you want it. <laughs> How about on the last one? Okay. All right, James, this will be our last one. So there was discussion of name security, namespaces. Um, so and you, people are saying, yeah, there are problems with that, but maybe for the audience, what are the actual challenges? And would it help to have like a container ID in the kernel? or something like that. Oh, good. I was afraid you were going to ask a really complicated question. <laughs> uh, yeah, this would be a quick one. Um, who who yes. wants to tackle yes. this one first? Yeah. No, I'm waiting for your answer. <laughs> uh, container ID is really nice. See, I'm, I'm the moderator. I ask the questions. I don't have to answer them. So. <laughs> yes, uh, I, a lot of people have been asking for that over the years. and. Container IDs would probably help. Um, it, we need some way to, to figure out what's being associated together as a container to even try to make a unifying uh, namespace type thing for the LSM. Because everybody's doing everything different, and uh, that's OK. But then 
you know, I'm doing something different and the namespaces are different and then SE Linux is doing something different. And when you try to get these all together, you have no idea what's going on. And if we had some way of grouping it, it would help us a little bit. I don't, I don't think it's a huge win uh, from a LSM namespacing point of view, but I do think it would help uh, to, uh, to, to be able to have something that groups all those different resources together so you see what's you know, there. Um, yeah, it, it's just a difficult problem. And, and having them, I refer to it as having them coming as going and not being able to group them and know what you're, how it's grouped is a major problem. Um, the other thing is locking is, becomes an issue and, and that's one of the main problems that, that we're having with the IMA namespacing is that anybody who's gonna start using um, state information per inode state information is gonna have the same problem because either the namespace is going away or the file is going away and how you have, um, can free them safely is a major um, thought. So any help with the locking that's gonna be involved. I think, yeah, there's two, I think there's two issues with, uh, with that. There's um, like ephemeral identification of a container mm -hmm. and this, well, basically everything which is related to the file system because you need to use extended attributes or stuff like that and then, well, you need to have a way to make them permanent. Um, for the ephemeral part, uh, maybe C groups might be useful, but that is not enough. Um, the other issue is the relationship between the security attributes and the various namespaces. For example, if we have our network and namespace, do we have se separate net, net label implementations and configurations for each? No, we don't. No. Um, with uh, user namespaces, did you want to have different security policies in the different namespaces? Well, some people say yes, you do. Other people say uh, no, you don't. Um, so if you want to do a system, a contain you want to do a container, it's using user namespaces, it's using network namespaces. Um, we're significantly complicating the whole notion. The containers are supposed to be simple, right? That's, that's why people buy them. Uh, they're simple, they're easy to use, and we're coming in and saying, well, if we're gonna do anything with these, and if we're gonna have security namespace separate from that, we have to, have to figure out how to, how to integrate them. If we're gonna make them part of those other namespaces, we have to integrate it in there. And any way you slice it, it's gonna get more complicated. Yeah, I think, I mean, as you've heard, it's, we're all aware of it. And I, I think the only thing that I think is really clear is that we need, I think we're all in agreement that we would like some concepts of some sort of kernel container ID. Um, but even, you know, what that means and the semantics behind that are, one of those things has been debated quite a bit. And, you know, I think that's gonna be largely a user space problem, but just being able to track that inside the kernel um, would I think be helpful. And then there's the other issue of namespacing, which we've talked about in a few of the questions. So you're gonna challenge the one last question thing, aren't you? <laughs> I wasn't going to ask a question. I was going to provide a, a running commentary. Oh, wow, please oh, do. No, no, no. I'm, just, uh, I'm just joking. I, this is a very hard problem, uh, I think. And uh, you know, we have tried various approaches over the years, the, with David's being the most aggressive one, as <laughs> usual. <laughs> Uh, um, like defining, basically ha really making uh, containers an in-kernel um, object, <coughs> which was rejected for um, for various reasons. The problem really is that I see is, if you look at services, for example, or service isolation, the, 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 it doesn't really make sense to define it as a container, but it uses every, every thinkable combination of isolation <coughs> is used out there, and that's what really makes it uh, 
difficult. So either we have to opt for, I think, we either we have to opt for something like we really make a rigid definition of what a container is and we don't care about the rest, but then you leave all of the Kubernetes folks and service isolation and so on people behind. It means you can't treat them as a container anymore. That's just some weird type of sandboxing. So, uh, sorry, um, ignore that. And, uh, that was a German word, right? Uh, yes. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Or, um, or you make it an arbitrary label, almost like PTAX, where you say this slap some identifier on there and that's what we we keep tracking as a container and it can be some sort of arbitrary combination between namespaces and C groups and whatever. And that's a hard boundary to draw and it's like, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and as an alternative would be to use what can, well, what some NSM can already provide, uh, let's say a domain for CDNUX or well, a lot of stuff or even a Linux domain. So yeah, there's a lot of different options. Um, but maybe the question is, what do we really want this feature for? Um, is it just to identify a set of processes, or is it to enforce some stuff on that? Uh, yeah. And there's likely going to be different answers per LSM. Yeah. Yep. So just to add another variable in there. Can I just say one use case? Yeah, so one use case would be people running containerized operating systems. So they have different distros running in containers. I think that's a reasonably common thing for people when they're building things um, to just be able to do their labeling, um, that kind of thing, um, and different, different, different versions. Um. All right. Well, I think out of respect for the schedule, which we've already <laughs> shot in the head 10 minutes ago. Um, this is Friday night, and I'm sure people have planes to catch and buses and trains. So uh, I think we'll go ahead and wrap up, but I think a few of us are going to be here for a little bit longer. So feel free to, to catch us in the hallway or in the back of the room. So just want to thank all of you for the questions. Um, thank the Linux Foundation, all of our sponsors, for helping out to run this and you know footing the bill for a large part of this. Um, we couldn't do that without them. So thank you, and thank you to all of you, and thank you to our panelists here. And um, I think that's it. I think we're done, right? Okay.